welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi, welcome to today's episode. I'm Sridhar Krishna, your host. I'm working on a project at Takshashila called the 20 Million Jobs Project. Here we're talking about ideas for creating an ecosystem in India where 20 million jobs can be created each year. India, as you know, has 18 million people who turn 18 each year. And we have at least 100 million people who are surplus in agriculture. And unless we create 20 million jobs, we're going to be in a very difficult spot. But on the other hand, we only create 2 million jobs each year. We don't create 20 million jobs. So the gap is huge and we're looking for ideas to fill that gap. One of the things that while we were doing our research, one of the things that we came up was on the aspect of access to credit and how access to credit is preventing India from creating the kind of jobs that possibly it could. So it's with great pleasure that I have Ram and Smitha on our episode today. And these Sram and Smitha are co-founders of Rangde, which is the first and only regulated peer-to-peer lending platform for the unbanked in India. So welcome to today's episode, Ram and Smitha. Thank you, Sridhar. Thank you, Sridhar. Yeah, so my first question, right? So I was reading, I was looking at your website and I saw, okay, what does Rangde do? And Rangde says that you're a peer-to-peer lending platform for the unbanked, right? So when you talk about the unbanked, What is the unbanked? Because I thought like, you know, lots of people in India have now got bank accounts. We've all, everybody's got at least a Jandan account. So does that mean that it's for people who don't even have a Jandan account? Is that who you mean by unbanked? Or do you have something else to sort of explain what the unbanked is? Yeah. So, you know, unbanked is really about being able to access your bank account and also avail services from the bank. And it's not having a bank account is one thing, but ability to put cash in that bank account and be able to take cash out of that bank account is critical to make somebody bankable. And that's the first step. Because once you do that, then you can look at other services such as accessing credit. And as a country, we still have a long way to go. Because doorstep access to banking is still some time away. Yeah. So the access to the banking, access to be able to like operate the account and like, you know, get access to credit also into that. Right. So how did you guys start off? I mean, you want to tell us about why do you think access to credit is so important? I mean, I have found that it's important, but I'd like to understand from you on uh, Smitha. Why don't you tell us? I mean, why is access to credit so important? So when we started Rangde, you know, it was a time when there was already a lot of microfinance in the country. And when we looked at it from an India perspective, something that really bothered us was the interest rates that were being charged. You know, we felt that there's something clearly going wrong here. Because when we looked at what was happening in Bangladesh and, you know, Professor Mohammed Yunus and his uh, Grameen Bank's model was an inspiration. And that is when, you know, we had felt that something like this can be done in India And what he was doing in Bangladesh and what was happening in India, there was a very stark difference. And when we looked at it, we said, you know, this is supposed to help people overcome poverty, help create employment. But on the other hand, the cost of credit for poor communities, low income communities was so high that even people like you and me cannot really afford to pay it. So we said, can we actually do something about it? And that's when we discovered what a huge challenge it is. One, in terms of access to credit. Two, in terms of choice. Do our communities even have a choice today to decide, you know, where do, where can they borrow from? You know, which lender is better? All they're ending up doing is borrow from money lenders at exorbitant interest rates. Or the other options they have are also not efficient enough. And that is when we felt that, you know, we believe credit is as important as, you know, your fundamental right, because that is the first gateway to access a whole lot of economic opportunities. And if that is denied, how do you actually go forward? 
or if you end up paying high interest rates what happens to the family you're constantly in this vicious cycle right so where uh, me and you are today we are in a place of privilege because we have both access as well as choice we are in fact spoiled for choice we have our credit cards every other day we have people calling us offering us personal loans and we have those options but then the same is not available to a majority of indians and we hope the peer to peer lending model can actually address this and create awareness for people like you and me on what is this problem of people not having access to credit yeah in fact when we talk about i mean i was watching the movie the other day the 1957 movie mother india right so i mean the story of that movie is like any other and and i think this kind of story gets repeated in it in so many different homes in rural india especially of people being having uh, being forced to take even small they they so starve for money that for absolutely strange things they go and have to borrow money and when they borrow money they borrow it at some absolutely ridiculous interest rates i was surprised recently that someone we knew and uh, we thought would be smarter actually had borrowed 2 lakh rupees at 10% per month interest rates from a local money lender and were paying such and unless if if somebody hadn't stepped in and like you know paid off that loan this family would have been completely in ruins right and this is a story which one would have expected in all these years of i mean india has had 75 years of independence and you'd have thought that that's one of the th- first things that we would solve and it's not a problem that's it's been identified as far back as like you know 65 years ago this movie was made right so i i think but why is it that nobody has done much about it in all these years and why is access to credit why has it been so hard is it because these people were poor credit risks in the first place is that why they were charged such high interest rates yeah so i think there is this whole um, you know there's a little bit of back story to this right so it just goes back to from the time when india became independent the nationalization of banks if you look at the postal system which was actually looked up as a alternative to traditional banking i'm sure all of us grew up with fond memories of postal savings accounts but what of what many of us may not know is that the postal savings accounts are actually the money in those accounts is deposited with the ministry of finance it is actually not regulated by rbi so and that is very very critical because as nandan nilkini once famously said india is not only a poor country we are a data poor country as well if you don't have data if you don't have transaction data in a bank account how could you then become eligible to borrow from a bank and if you can't borrow therefore you will not have credit bureau data so it kind of becomes a situation where you actually don't move forward so in india we had this evolution over the years of sg bank linkage program where the idea was to save small amounts of money in a group bank account and then the bank manager where the account is they would get to choose how much they would want to lend to that group but all these measures in many ways were meant to be temporary measures until the communities could have their own individual bank accounts like most of us have and also borrow at on their own terms now and i think that's been something which is got which has got addressed thankfully a few years ago when the india post received its payments bank license so every post office in india now has become a bank and it has a very by regulation it has a mandate that they cannot lend they can only open bank account and provide other saving services so what it does is it helps the communities for the first time to access doorstep banking so it's a great step forward i think we have a lot to look forward to and i feel we will get there eventually yeah and uh, when you talk about this i mean i i'm also sort of reminded of i think you told me when we were having a conversation earlier about uh, how jam as a slightly outdated concept right because one thought that with jandan aadhar and mobile there's now a bank account with aadhar there's now a proper identity and with mobile you sort of create more access for larger number of uh, people 
And but why do you think that that didn't really take off in the way that it could have? Yeah, I think it comes down to this whole access. It's called Kiko, as I mentioned earlier, cash in, cash out. So you could have a Jandan account, which is very far away from where you actually live. And even if you travel to the bank, given the bank infrastructure, the capacity of the banks, they are not served in the manner in which they should be served. So they end up waiting at the bank branch and they also end up losing a day's livelihood because they have to travel to the bank. And also, even though the jam trinity, as it was called, it was it was obviously well thought through, but you also had the mobile access, which was not as widespread as many of us wanted to believe it to be because of the data which was coming out. And we saw much later that many people had many phones and therefore the data looked a bit um, much bigger than what it was. And also access to smartphones was obviously very limited, especially in the last mile. Yes, Smitha, you wanted to say something on this, I think. Yeah, I just wanted to share um, an anecdote, you know, from uh, our work with communities very close to Bangalore. We were actually running our financial literacy center there. And this was really based on, you know, um, the in some sense, JAM was the inspiration to start this financial literacy program because we wanted to see what would it take for people to start using their bank accounts regularly. And um, I remember working in this uh, village about uh, 80 kilometers from Bangalore. And we were almost stationed there for the first few months until the community members got familiar with us. And um, there was no other bank in that uh, region except for Corporation Bank. And this was like about a few kilometers from the village. And I remember, you know, uh, one of the things that the uh, community members were trying to do is get their passbooks updated. And um, because as part of the financial literacy program, they had to visit the bank regularly and see, you know, uh, and transact more with their bank accounts. And they could not get their passbooks updated for months because, you know, of of very silly reasons, like, you know, the printer is not working and things like that. And they had lost so many hours of livelihood because they would end up going to this bank, waiting there for things to happen. And it wouldn't really happen. So just, you know, extending what Ram shared about how access is taken for granted, right? But then it's so important that, you know, people have easy access to their bank accounts and they're treated well. Why would you feel like going back to the bank account, you know, bank, if you do not have that sort of a welcoming environment there? I think in India, you know, you might have access to something, you might have a right of entry to certain places, but then different people get treated differently when you go to the same place. And all of us don't have the same experience when we visit a restaurant or a bank or any of these other places, right? And I think, um, yeah, and I think not having access, I think that's another one. In fact, I was talking to somebody from the University of Ohio a while back, and he was talking to me about uh, digital access and how that's so important. And he talked about things that are important are like, you know, the fact that you have access to digital, but there's also about literacy and knowing how to use digital well. And similarly, I think it's also about financial literacy is also a very important thing. It's not just about access. I think people also knowing, you talked about financial literacy here, and I think financial literacy is so important, right? I mean, people knowing that what does an interest rate mean? What does compound interest versus a simple interest? What what happens when you borrow money at like X percent interest and you don't repay the principal, which is when it's due? What happens to it and so on? And I think if people don't know that, I think that opaqueness can ruin lives. You know? And uh, so that's, that's great. And I think I wanted to um, come back to saying, talk to us a little bit about uh, Rangde and how it's all started and how did you guys sort of team up? Did you meet while sort of finding Rangde or did you meet before that? So, so, so you've decided, Smitha, that Ram should answer this question. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I mean, for our audience, Ram and Smitha are married to each other and co-founders of Rangde. Yeah. So it goes back many years before we started uh, Rangde. And uh, I used to volunteer for a couple of non-profits in Bangalore. And that is when I met Smitha. I was a software engineer back then and uh, she actually hated software engineers. 
So, but I wanted to get into the social space because even though I looked and sounded like a software engineer, but my thinking and my plans for the future were entirely to get into the social space sooner than later. And uh, was that after you found out that Smitha was interested in the social space, or <laughs> no? Actually, <laughs> it is okay. So the inspiration to move into the social space happened during my engineering days. Okay, so that's a. Uh, very interesting story but i will not go there but and that is where i felt that and it was that experience in my, during my engineering days helped me discover this very powerful insight that all of us have empathy in us but it's quite often that we do not perhaps express it because we never get an opportunity to do so so the idea was to really see and discover more ways in which people can express empathy and that is how i got very uh, you know very excited about getting into social space and when i met smita you know both of us had a very similar thoughts about what we wanted to do with our lives and we soon got married and we was on four and we moved to the uk and uh, we started living in a beautiful village there called kidlington and that is when we started discovering for the first time what people back home meant when they said india is a developing country because india obviously had a long way to go to get to the state we were experiencing back there so we made a promise to ourselves we said two years it is that we'll move back to india and start something meaningful in the social space what that something would be really did not bother us because when you when you come from a country like india you're spoiled for choice uh, so 2006 is when we put that goal for ourselves and uh, by then we were looking at a few ideas we We are researching a few causes which we want to focus on, and we looked at several ideas like child labour. How do we holistically solve it? How do we create doorstep rural employment? How do we build empathy? Create more empathy for Indians? And finally, we discovered microcredit because Mohammed Unas and the Grameen Bank had jointly won the Nobel Peace Prize. So the announcement announcement was just made, and when we googled it a bit, we obviously felt very good about them. But when we googled it a bit, we felt initially that India doesn't need it. and uh, we are far better off than bangladesh but to our surprise we found that india was actually behind bangladesh in the back then only 7.7% of india's eligible population had access to credit we also stumbled across articles which spoke about the high borrowing rates in india especially in andhra pradesh 45% plus and on the other hand we were reading mohammad unas book called how to create a world without poverty and it it had a very pristine definition of how credit should be designed and delivered in a manner which it so that it creates value for the communities you want to serve and we couldn't help wonder that microcredit especially in india was a classic case of a product designed exclusively for the poor but so expensive that the rich cannot afford it that got us started and uh, coincidentally peer to peer platforms were just taking off one in uk called zopa that was the first first then kiva in the us which was again a platform focused on serving the base of the pyramid this construct was we loved the construct of peer to peer because we felt especially in a country like india this construct can do two things one provide a beautiful alternative to mainstream credit uh, uh, access and two it would also help bridge the massive empathy gap which we have in our country because unlike donations or anything or charity here you are actually investing in a community member who is working as hard as you probably did to earn that money to return the money with interest and at some point you will help you can't help noticing who this person is where is this person he is thought of and at some point you may also want to go and visit this community perhaps spend a day with them and uh, and our belief was that would bring about a big change in the way people are perceiving and uh, addressing some of the problems which india is facing that's very fascinating ram and i will go deeper into the rangdey story and how this kind of uh, method can be scaled up and replicated after a short break okay welcome back and um so smitha now oh, you want to tell us some I mean, and how you sort of I mean, both of you decided at the same time that this is what you wanted to do or you sort of you decided at different times to 
get involved in peer to peer lending yeah so it was kind of a joint decision mainly because soon after we went to the uk we spent a lot of time discussing ideating you know on what we wanted to do and both of us had our favorite causes and we really wanted to do something around it so many of these also translated into business plans and you know planning how we are going to launch it and everything so it was like a joint discussion and um, then 2006 was when in some sense we discovered this whole new world of microcredit thanks to professor yunus and then we discussed it and we were like yes i think this is going to be a very important and very critical piece you know that will help in addressing and helping people overcome poverty so how did you actually start how do you how did you do this oh that's an interesting story uh, i'll start in probably ramkin pitchin so we decided on you know rang day and that it's going to be the peer to peer lending model and then we had to really find two sets of partners so we wanted a technology partner who can help us build the platform and we were also looking for a branding partner a creative agency who can help us with branding design and everything because we felt that the name rangde was beautiful and in some sense it's it could appeal to people because we have always imagined rangde to be a movement not an organization and we felt that that name had that call to action and people would join us so we were looking for these two sets of partners both of us had our full time jobs then uh and thanks to the time difference between UK and India it worked out really well for us i remember having 4 am starts every day in the morning and catching up with people in india trying to figure out you know who can actually help us build this platform reaching out to all the biggies all the creative agencies ohms of the world saying you know this is what we are trying to do and can you help us so lots of dead ends but lots of uh, conversations opening up as well up to a point where i think we were so obsessed with the idea that i couldn't really continue to do my full time job anymore because you know it was not fair you know for my employer because i would be sitting at work but i would constantly be thinking about you know what's the next thing that we need to do for rangbe so i'll let ram talk about how we actually uh, got our technology partner that's a very interesting story ram you want to share that yeah so you know we used to get up at 4 in the morning and um, yeah, we did this for about 3 months and um, and a lot of dead ends so apart from losing some sleep we didn't lose any money because we couldn't find anybody who, who could join forces with us and i used to keep you know joking at uh, smita said that we need the world's best technology team to partner with us because this is mission critical and to our surprise just when we were about to give up we got introduced to a person called sharath hegde he was not an ordinary person in fact he was the first employee of infosys narayan murthy talks about him in his book saying that he had the rare distinction of getting interviewed by all the seven co-founders and surviving it <laughs> uh so he ended up having a chat with me for 2 hours those days it was only skype audio call and uh, i survived his call and he said well i'm done with my questions and uh, let me get back to you and connect with a bunch of techies who will build this platform and as promised he connected with a, a a team which had spent 15 years with infosys and they were moving out of infosys infosys to set up a boutique consulting firm and they were also part of the core team which built finical Infosys award winning co-back yeah. solution and they felt this was a very good sign for them to actually build something for India initially it was a bit hard for them to believe that we were not super rich nris based in oxford but when they were convinced they gave us a massive discount and they became our technology partners so how was your funding for all this yeah sorry smita go ahead yeah so we took complete advantage of our nri status <laughs> while we were there because we saw that a lot of people took us very seriously when they heard that oh they are in our eyes so a lot of conversations happened initially we we had kind of planned it all we had set aside 6000 pounds that was all the savings we had and we said that if this is an idea that has to work it'll work within this because we had realized that all we had was an idea we were two people with no backgrounds you know nothing to really write home about and nobody is going to take us seriously unless we launch a prototype and show that this is really going to work 
So we had no funding pressure because of the six thousand pounds, and that's what really took us all the way up to doing our first launch on twenty six Jan two thousand eight. So it was only after that that we received our funding, but that confidence really helped us because you know、mm-hmm. we could really focus on building the platform and planning the operations. Um, it it also happened that one of the biggest road shows in the microfinance industry was happening around that time in October two thousand seven, and we gate crashed into that. And because that was really our go to market in some sense, because we were launching Rangbe as an idea, telling people that this is what we are trying to do, and we are trying to lower the cost of credit. So、mm. that road show was like a huge. Success, you know, people were like lining up to come to our stall, and many people wondered where we were coming from、mm. because you know nobody in that roadshow was really talking about the cost of credit. Everybody was、mm. just celebrating how microfinance could be this, you know, magic bullet, you know, to everybody's problems, but nobody was really hitting the nail on the head. So we got some amazing set of you know mentors, you know, partner organizations to work with in this roadshow. And then we went live a few months later after a lot of field visits, re- meeting a lot of communities, you know, designing and understanding, you know, how what it takes to create better loan products for the community. So a lot of work actually went in between that roadshow and us actually going live. So this is this is wonderful, right? I think you know it's always inspiring to talk to people who have founded something and created a company and built it to a and and then especially so when it. When you're talking about doing something really meaningful, something that's impacting lots of lives, you know, and and especially lives of people who are from marginalized communities and who really have not had ac- the kind of access that we all sort of grew up and took for granted, and、um, so so it's thank thanks for sharing, and I want to know a little bit about how does this work? So, I mean, how many people have you lent to so far? And、uh, how do you find the people that you want to lend to? In our fourteen-year journey,、um, initially as a non-profit and now as a regulated entity, we have disbursed a little over hundred crores and、um, supported over sixty-five thousand、uh, low-income families. Actually, a little more than that. Now, close to around eighty thousand families that we have supported. Yeah, and、uh, close to about twenty thousand social investors. Have actually lent this money, so they're basically individuals like you and me who have gone online and you know invested in individuals and enterprises. So that's that's our journey so far. Yeah. So how do you find them, Ram? How do you find decide who to lend to? Yeah. So that's a great question. So we work with community partners on the ground, and these are community partners who have spent a significant amount of time trying to create or sustain livelihoods in the geographies they work. For example, this could be an organization like Pradhan. It could be an organization like Vasan. It could be Center for Sustainable Agriculture. It could be any organization. It could be you know we are sector agnostic. We're also very agnostic to where they are based. What we really look for in a community partner is their leadership, their values, and their track record of actually working with the communities. What Rangde does is beautifully complements our partners' efforts to bring about change in the communities through livelihoods by providing them just in time and the right amount of credit which they need to make sure the communities are able to enhance their livelihoods. And so you work with partners. These partners identify projects or people who are working on specific ideas. So I was reading on your website. That somebody wanted to buy a buffalo so that she could go out and like you know give、uh, sell milk and then make money and like she needed is fifty thousand rupees or sixty thousand rupees to go and buy a buffalo right so and then so once that is identified then there are a bunch of people then you put that up and then you get a bunch of people to come in and invest on those specific ideas how do your people evaluate those ideas right so what we really do is we do that evaluation right up. Front, where as the communities come onto the platform, they go through a onboarding process, which involves checking their credit score, evaluating the business proposal to see if that is something which it meets the Rangde's standards for lending money to them. And if you find that there are communities who have never borrowed before, 
that's absolutely fine because we still evaluate them based on the merit of the business they want to sustain or start and and once that is done we then publish their profiles uh, it goes through a content approval workflow there's a little bit of technology which we use there and which fi- then finally it gets published and that is when we get to invest in that community member so so the underwriting so building this to sorry i wanted to sort of understand so you you go so these are projects that have been identified and the people who have those partners with whom you're working they have already assessed whether these are viable projects right when you talk about and are they how do you decide whether they are viable enough to borrow money and repay a loan yeah so that is that's the, two, the two different things isn't it yeah, the role of the partner becomes sacrosanct because we do not work with partners who are only enabling access to credit for their communities we work with partners who are hand holding mentoring and supporting the communities they work with the only piece which is missing there is access to credit yeah so that's the big one smita yeah i just wanted to add to it so it kind of happens in two parts the business viability is done by the partner on the ground because the partner is also involved in providing that kind of hand holding market access those critical things that are needed for this venture to become successful the loan repayment ability is done by us as part of our you know credit appraisal process based on the data that is shared with us on the loan application form so it happens in two parts so the credit bureau checks the loan repayment ability those things are done by our team with a little bit of technology and human intervention Yeah. so how do you know that somebody willing to repay sometimes they're able to pay but there could be like you know willful defaulters also happen on loans so how are you protecting against things like that i think a large part of that you know is taken care of because of the curation process because the curation happens at different levels one is about a lot of effort goes into identifying who we want to partner with so they're not just any other organization they're like organizations who are working on livelihood issues are thought leaders in the space so there's a curation that happens at that level and there's a curation that happens at the investee level so it actually reduces cases where you know there are willful defaults because there's a lot of vetting and background verification that happens through all of these processes uh, to give you just to give you a sense in the last 14 years we have not had a single willful default from the community in uh, the 101 we have this bus yeah we have we have had issues where you know we have gone wrong in selecting the partners and things have gone wrong there but it's never happened that the communities have taken a loan from us and have refused to repay without any genuine reasons so wherever there are delays there are delays because of extraordinary circumstances like the pandemic or there's a natural calamity and even those delays are delays they're not defaults even right now people are coming back and repaying trying to recover from the pandemic so that's why we have we rely on this curation process that we have and i believe that's the expertise that we have built now great so do you think that this model that you've got is scalable and do you believe that i mean now you've said you've lent to about 80000 people and you you've lent about 100 crores but we know that it's a drop in the ocean right i mean in terms of the real need for india in terms of the amount of credit that's needed versus what is actually available i was reading a report on uh, the msme sector for instance and said even the msme sector is has access to only uh, 15% of all the credit that it really needs so when you have that kind of a gap i mean this idea is wonderful to make make an impact in a I mean, for two people to get together and say, "I've made a change. I made an impact." This is wonderful, right? But how do you make it into something that's like you know, tomorrow to lend thousand crores or ten thousand crores, or to have eight hundred thousand people or eighty million people whom you lend to? How would you do something? How is this model sort of replicable, or do you need to do something differently? I think the only way that you know uh, access to credit can actually be scaled is. by leveraging the peer to peer lending construct and the reason i'm saying this is it kind of democratizes access to credit 
and what we have done is really just scratch the surface so think about it okay i was recently in nagaland and you know we do a lot of work in nagaland with a partner called entrepreneurs associates there are a bunch of successful entrepreneurs in nagaland who entrepreneurs associates has enabled has incubated help them scale up then there are entrepreneurs who are just starting up so imagine a scenario where our peer to peer lending model can actually have a community lending initiative within nagaland where successful nagaland entrepreneurs are using the rangde platform you know a regulated platform to lend to their peers who are just starting up now and that is just one use case so i feel that this model has so much potential that we have hardly really you know scratched the surface and it humanizes credit it democratizes credit and it disintermediates the bank so if if yeah i get that this idea is is big and what you've done so far is only scratching the surface i understand that but see right now you are one of the big things that you do is evaluate partners right so evaluating partners i mean like is a is a linear process i mean it's not by itself i mean how do you sort of scale that how what are your plans for scaling evaluation of partners or or do you say that each organization would be of this size but then there could be many people who could just do what you're doing yeah so, so how do you you know i think yeah. the the good part of pot evaluation is that we already have a very strong civil society organizations you know across the country now many of them in fact have already been working in the livelihood space and post pandemic the there's a renewed focus on working in creating and sustaining livelihoods now as we stand as it stands today we have visibility to provide credit to 1 million low income households across the country but this is thanks to our long innings in this space so and again thanks to our amazing impact partners across the country so and these are communities who are trustworthy and credit worthy at the same time all they need is access to credit so that part i guess it's more or less solved and it's non linear scaling up because once we train it's entirely digital it's paperless cashless and it it just scales because it's just we're just replicating the model across all our partners and and therefore the challenge which we need to now solve is that how do we non linearly and organically at the same time uh, scale access to capital yeah so that's that's another one so what policy initiatives do you think can help uh, this space grow are there something policy impediments to to your progress but one thing could be that the csr money if that can be the policy allows the the csr funds to be invested in a social peer to peer platform or if the employees of a corporate if they choose to invest then that is also given some special tax um, treatment or something yeah. you know benefit of some tax that would that would really Uh, make mainstream social peer to peer investing or lending yeah and the way i see it is it's it's a it's a commercial venture at some level right so basically you also have to i mean the people who are giving investors who are there uh while they may be in, not looking for extraordinary returns they do expect that there would be some return on their money and they are and that it's not that they're just giving away this money for one year for one person to buy a buffalo but they're actually able to the person who bought the buffalo has made made has made money has repaid the loan and then you're able to like finance a herd of buffaloes if you will over time right so i think um, you want that to happen and so it has to be so are your investors happy with the with the kind of returns that they are getting it's not to compare with something else but from their perspective what they expected and how with the returns do you think your investors are happy with the returns that they're getting for something like this yeah absolutely you know because i think it's very important to understand that you know this is a debt instrument this is actually a loan hmm. so and i think all of us are getting this unique opportunity to actually lend money to someone and while doing so 
we are actually obviously you know creating value for the community but also creating credit score perhaps for the first time for this mm-hmm. person whom we are lending money to in other words you are becoming a banker to this person and making this person bankable for the future yeah that's wonderful thank you very much yeah so i was reading this uh, paper by uh, beck kunt and levin called finance inequality and the poor and it talks about how financial development exerts a disproportionately positive impact on the relatively poor so i think you know i wish you all the best at both of you at rangde and and i hope that uh, more such colorful people get involved and create organizations like this and make access to credit more easily available to everyone thank you thank you so much rida thanks so much rida for having us if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in